on the wall on the back, we have a poster board that says, What Would Jesus Really Do? And uh, we've been handing out tracts such as that at our family ministries during the summer and available online. Uh, try to raise the question regarding what Jesus actually did in his earthly ministry when he was here and what he's doing today. In fact, dispensational Bible study is surrounded around the idea of trying to learn what is the will of God and what is God doing, which is clearly articulated in the Bible rightly divided. And so we try to bring to people's attention the, the consequences of ideas and wrong ideas when they start asking questions like, what would Jesus do? And so I want to talk about it today. What did Jesus do? A biblical answer to a more important question, which is going to be what did he do, not what would he do? Because we know what he did. What would he do? That's open up more to your imagination and speculation. But what he did, we have in the scripture. Ideas have consequences, and the what would Jesus do idea is not a new one. Okay? I have on the board here a timeline going back the last 500 years in, in society and history. And in the 17th century, if you look in the history books, you have something called the scientific revolution. Science, of course. You have also in the 1500s the Reformation and the Renaissance. So where are you going? History lesson today, huh? Pull up a pillow. The Reformation, the Renaissance. The Reformation was when people started studying the Bible for themselves. We covered the doctrine of sola scriptura before. The Renaissance was this idea of going back to the source of, of uh, material and literature in ancient times. And part of the reason for that was something called the printing press. When it was invented in the 1400s, books and pamphlets and tracts started to abound. Information access was just, it exploded. And thus you have a questioning of what we're doing, what we're doing, and what happened. Reformation in the Renaissance. Science even was more capably um, uh, something that people could do in that they can observe things, re record the, the thoughts down. It changed what people thought. They started looking at the material world and said, well, how does this work? And the early scientists were, of course, doing it on the basis of them having a Bible which described to them what God did. And so they looked at the natural world and said, well, if God has this order to things, then we're going to try to figure this out to try to improve people's lot. And so that's where science came from back here in the Renaissance and Reformation, where people started having more access to information. Also, around this time, theologically, you had people for, for about 1,500 years, what reigned in the Christian religion community was a doctrine called amillennialism, this idea of spiritualizing the kingdom of God. Okay, and so what Christians were to do were to live and work and operate in the kingdom of God, but you don't see it in the world because it's spiritual. And Christ reigns in heavenly places of the spiritual kingdom. And we'll all go there someday, and we're simply trying to live in the city of God, or the kingdom of God, spiritually spoken now. So this allegorical reading of the Bible was prominent for 1,500 years. But when people started getting a Bible in their own hands, when people started questioning, well, let's study material things and science, scientific method, suddenly you're taking things literally. It was, it was interesting to people to study the science that they could find in the scripture. Like, what about those six days? And what about the exact times, the chronologies? And what about these, the, the, the literal reading of this text as people were studying it? And so you had this doctrine of post-millennialism start to arise. There were two reactions to reading the Bible literally, and one was... Uh, premillennial, which is historical, uh, uh, historical Christians believed in that, which was that the millennium, the thousand years uh, uh, where Christ would return to set up his kingdom on the earth, a literal kingdom, was a literal thing. And it will happen in the future when Christ returns, before the millennium. Postmillennialism also takes a literal view of the kingdom on earth, and that they say it's not here now, it will be here. They simply think Christ will return after we set it up. But again, the literal idea that we need this world to change. Okay, we're not living in a spiritual kingdom, like it's going to change, it will literally change, was the idea of post-millennial and pre-millennialism. Okay, post-millennialism back there as a result of that. Started moving into the 1700s, 1800s, uh, you start having the Industrial Revolution over here. Industry, manufacturing, the result of the scientific discovery of how things work, the invention of new fields of study, was we can create machines to make life easier. The Industrial Revolution. Ideas have consequences. At the same time, this Industrial Revolution started happening, factories and machines, you see what people were seeing as a, an increase in wealth or prosperity or opportunity, and thus people look back on where they were and saying, well, I think we're seeing some people not yet all caught up with that. So we're seeing people with great wealth and and, and technology, then there's people that don't have access to that, a great inequality in the world. 
And so uh, teachings like communism and socialism became, uh, came to arise economically, where they looked at the material things as a result of an approach to science, as a result of the printing press, and a result of the machinations that were going on in the world, and saying, these children are working too long of hours. We're working too long of hours. Like, we need better machines. So everyone doesn't have to work, you know. And so you have this communism and socialism idea, which was looking at the marginalized and saying, um, we need this to, to, for everyone not to work so hard, right? Um, in fact, it is a whole doctrine based upon a, a, an idea of work uh, and, and who, what work's value was. And so from the, uh, the 19th century, the 1800s, uh, in religious circles, you had from post-millennialism this idea that the world was getting better. I mean, look at the machines. Look at the cogs that we have. Look at the, the inventions happening. One of the, the most revolutionary inventions was uh, the linotype machine. You all know what this is? No, you don't. Why? Because it's outdated, right? The linotype machine. The linotype machine is what invented daily newspapers, printing press, which meant that we don't have to handwrite every letter. We can actually take a, a letter, put ink on it, and stamp it instead of handwriting everything. That's revolutionary. Revolutionary here was that instead of putting a block letter into the printing press, guess what? We put a whole line at a time. Newspapers, which were being printed, went from being weekly or monthly newsletters to daily newspapers, because they can print it that fast. They can type it on a linotype machine, and it would print a line, and thus print the whole paper in one day. And so you went from having the news given to you from last week, a week later, to having the news given to you yesterday, today. That's a huge advancement. Now, you can sympathize with this, because we're going through a similar revolution today, where it's like, who needs a newspaper? That's yesterday's news. I get the news Today, this minute, right now. We well, see that shifts the thinking. Everybody has access to information now. You can learn things faster than people can even report it because everyone is a witness with their smartphones. But see, this is the revolution going on in the last 500 years. It's access to information, ideas being changed, right? Bibles being put into people's hands. The civilization apparently looking like it's getting better. Maybe we're going to build the kingdom here, right? There's factories going on. We see a plight of certain people. We need to fix that plight. And the evolution of society will, will give us a utopia on earth, you know. Communism and socialism. Christians borrowed this, these ideas, and you had the rise of Christian socialism, right? which is part and parcel with this postmillennial idea of that this is where we're going before Christ returns. Or the social gospel. You ever heard of the social gospel? Okay. A teaching that, again, arose in the 1700s, 1800s as a result of postmillennialism that taught that the gospel, the, the usefulness of the gospel and the scripture is not so much the individual, but cultural, like collective. It's like that we can change society by the advances that have resulted from the Bible. You know, so they tried to tie it to that. So the Bible is useful as long as it helps society progress. Thus, progressivism, okay, social gospel. Christians preach this message, social gospel, Christian socialism, right? In 1896, there was a Christian socialist who was an advocate, an early advocate of the social gospel, changing society by means of your religious instruction, who wrote a book that would go on to have in print over 50 million copies, one of the world's most printed books called In His Steps. The subtitle was What Would Jesus Do? Okay. I bring it up because it's significant a factor in the last 120 years or so, okay? As we progress to the 20th century, in 1896, we have What Would Jesus Do in print? It was a hit immediately. Right? People loved it. What did he write in this book? Anybody read In His Steps? Charles Sheldon? Yeah. What's he teaching there? It's a story, it's a fiction, of uh, a man out of work. Why is he out of work? Because he was a, a printing press operator. And they invented the linotype machine. Put him out of job, right? So he walked into the church and uh, wanted to ask for help from the preacher. The preacher talked to him, but he was kind of busy preparing the sermon for Sunday, and so the guy left. He taught the sermon on Sunday. The same man walked into the church, walked up front, turned around, rebuked the church for not giving more attention to the plight of the poor and those that are needy in this world, and uh, he collapsed and died subsequently. The preacher was guilt-ridden and later encourages the congregation to uh, walk every day asking the question, what would Jesus do? which the communication throughout the rest of the book is applying principles that the social gospel would include uh, to change the way you operate to help those that are less than you, right? The poor, the grief-stricken, the 
unhealthy, things like this. Okay, the hurting. And that was, what would Jesus do? In his steps, what would Jesus do? Let's walk in Jesus' steps asking what would he do and live accordingly. And this has been an idea that has been popularized 120 years ago that is still popular today. What would Jesus do? In the 20th century, you have ideas having consequences. The Scopes trial. If you don't know the Scopes trial, you need to learn about that. In the early 20th century, the Scopes trial was a court case between creation and evolution. Well, not exactly that, but that's what it was made out to be. Okay? And what it was made out to be in the public opinion, creationism lost. Of course, they didn't lose the court case, and they didn't really lose theologically, but you know, PR matters in the 20th century because we've got daily newspapers now. Like, you're getting news immediately. What people think matters. It's even worse today, or better, depending on your opinion. Like, you get up to the minute, up to the second response. Well, that's great. But what's that mean? People's public opinion matters quite a bit. As soon as the scandal releases, there's no time to edit the thing. It's out. Right? People think of you matters. And so, so Scope's trial put a big black stain on the Bible. You can't believe the Bible literally. Well, I thought that's, that was the new thing 500 years ago. Well, in one sense, everyone had a Bible, but now we've gone past that. We've progressed in our science and understanding and technology and advancement that you can't take that book, literally, right? We're smarter than that now. That was the idea. And so continuing through the 20th century, you had Christians who said they were Christians who would deny fundamentals of Christianity, the deity of Christ, the, the authority of Scripture, the resurrection from the dead. Right, they would deny these things. And so there was a big tussle between those who said, no, you, you have to believe those things to be a Christian. You can't be a Christian without believing Christ's death for your sins and salvation by grace through faith, and that he's God manifest in the flesh. You have to believe those, or else Christianity is nothing. Which, of course, was the goal of the 1900s, to remove Christianity from being the only option. And it was done by folks using the literal bringing in of a kingdom the technological advances, the teaching the kingdom is going to come if we just allow it, and what's preventing us from doing that is looking back at the past. Right? In the name of Jesus Christ, what would he do? Feed the poor, help you know, house the homeless, clothe the naked. The world would be a better place. In fact, we've got systems in place that can make that possible, bring wealth to the world, distribute wealth appropriately, then Christ's kingdom can be here. Christ's intention can be fulfilled. The social gospel, that's what that is. You can hear this being echoed in some of the teachings and thoughts even today in 2022. Okay. The neo-evangelicals in the early 20th century had a concession or compromise with the moderns. They said, well, that sounds pretty good. We love the technology, the advanced, the progressive nature of what our society is going. And yet, uh, we still kind of believe the Bible a little bit. But we won't bring that up. For the sake of progress of all. And that's, in a nutshell, the evangelical movement of the 20th century. Okay. Lyndon Baines Johnson, heard of him? A significant presidential uh, administration in the 20th century uh, taught the social gospel when he was younger. His major claim to political fame is something called the Great Society. Do you see any similarity between the, that idea of a great society and this post millennial literal kingdom on the earth theology of if we could just apply religious language, religious ideas and principles and morals, or maybe patterns of Jesus to our society? We can do that which Christ failed to do bring in a kingdom. Right, LBJ, the Great Society. Of course, those who actually have studied the issue have seen that a lot of things have gone wrong since the so-called political creation of the Great Society. But in the 1990s, late 1900s, you, at the 100-year anniversary of the printing of the book, what would Jesus do? Again, bestseller, right? Very influential in Christian circles. I mean, how can you argue against what would Jesus do? I mean, he's Jesus, and you should do things like he did. A resurgence of WJD. Anyone own a WJD bracelet? I did. Like, it, it's fat. It goes around. It's like slap bracelets, you know? That too. That's gone. WJD, books, bracelets printed. There's nothing going to the sun. Okay, the ideas have come up again and again and again, formed from different things that are going on in history. What would Jesus do is an idea that was born out of consequences of wrong doctrines, of things and failures of people's thinking, but also it doesn't put us in a good place today. But it's something very well accepted in the Christian community. Why? Because they've accepted the change in doctrine, the change of ideas throughout history. Justin, what, what problem do you have with WWJD? Really, what is the issue here? I mean, shouldn't more people think like Jesus thinks? Right. 
The problem is this. When asking what would Jesus do, how do you know what he would do? It's given as an assumption in, in his steps, if you read the book, that what Jesus would do is what this political policy is that we're now advocating for. How do you know? We've talked before about politics and Jesus. Our political position is an ambassador of Christ. We live in a present evil world, according to the Bible, Galatians 1, verse 4. How do you know what Jesus would do? In fact, that's the exercise, isn't it? You wear the bracelet or the T-shirt or whatever it is, and you ask yourself, in making some major life choice, what would Jesus do about this? Or in confronted in some circumstance, what would Jesus do in this situation? And that's the question. And now you're oriented your mind around Jesus. But what do you think of Jesus? What do you know of his will? Right? And that, that what follows then is a lot more ignorance. Because it's like, well, Jesus is a... Erase their history lesson here. Who is Jesus? I remember seeing advertisements. What would Jesus drive? You ever see those? What would Jesus drive? A car advertisement. Because what would Jesus do? What would Jesus wear? Yes. What would Jesus eat? Mm, interesting. Deep theology here. Right? Well, he was a law-abiding Jew. He wouldn't eat bacon, that's for sure. Okay. Well, that's the old Jesus. I like the new Jesus. I mean, we progressed past some of that. Who was Jesus? Well, they typically filter and fashion him after their own likeness. They say, well, Jesus was kind. What would Jesus do? Be kind. Thus, we have from New Age doctrine, or more accurately spoken of Eastern religion, the idea of if you could choose between kind and being right, choose kind every time. That is from Hinduism. Okay, it's, it's Eastern New Age religion. Okay, kindness is not the chief principle of mankind. Right? But Jesus, no doubt, is kind. And so, oh, should I, what would Jesus do in the situation? Well, I would be kind to one another. Okay, be kind. Jesus, meek and mild. Don't yell so much. I mean, Jesus. You never yell at people. Mild Jesus, right? Jesus loves everybody, right? In fact, God is love. Jesus came preaching love. He loves all, except for some people in authorities. But, you know, those are, it's authorities. I mean, he was, he, was a, he was a social rebel. He came to overturn the social system. You hear the language here. Like, what good is the gospel of Jesus Christ? To change society, right? Social rebel. He never said no. So he came up to Jesus, and he said, let the children come. Remember? Children want to come. The disciples said, nope, nope. This is adult conversation. Jesus said, no, no, come on. Bring them up. Let the children come. Okay, you had the sick, the poor, the, the people who were ostracized, the marginalized society. They would come up to Jesus, and he says, come on. He ate with the tax collectors, right? Never said no. No doubt if they asked Jesus to watch a porn film, he'd be like, well, I love you, buddy. Did he ever say no? This is Jesus. What would Jesus do? I'm going to live my life accordingly. Where do you get this information? You know, Charles Sheldon wrote many books after What Would Jesus Do uh, in His Steps. One was called, the sequel to In His Steps was called Jesus Is Here. You, anybody know that? Anybody read that book? Jesus Is Here? It's the sequel to in his steps. And Jesus is here. Jesus actually comes and visits the characters of the first book. Like, wow, okay. So they were asking, what would Jesus do? And then Jesus actually comes to evaluate, well, how did you do? Right? I mean, he gets on TV shows and things, because this is the 20th century, you know. And he goes to this big city. So Jesus goes to the big city. That was Jesus is here. That got a lot more negative reviews than the first one, as you might suppose. But it was totally in the realm of Charles Sheldon's thinking, because it's like, the Bible isn't the issue here. The issue is how we ought to behave and change society to better the principles that we think are socially acceptable. Right? In Jesus is here, Jesus was described quite often as like an average man, only different. And you see this idea perpetuated even today. Okay, you want to present Jesus as just, an, just like anybody else. He's just an average guy. That's what Charles Sheldon said over 100 years ago. Like an average guy, only different. There's something about him. He's just kind. He just never yells at anybody. He loves, he's just, he's just overturning social ideas of division. He wants to bring people together. He's a great unifier. Jesus, what a guy. Everyone would love him. You have no reason to hate him. Well, this could be a problem. How, why is that? Because is that the real Jesus in the Bible? Or does it matter? 
Really the issue in, in, in his steps was when they talked about Jesus and what he would do is they would go back to what he did in the Gospels. Okay. What he did in the Gospels, which was feed the poor. He cared about the poor and the homeless and the sick and the hurting right? and the lower classes. This describes Jesus' attention to those people. Did he come for the rich and for the religious? No. He came for the poor and the homeless and the sick, right? The disparaged, the ostracized. You've heard that message before quite often. It comes from a historical place. Ideas have consequences. That's the benefit that Jesus gives to society according to the social gospel. But the focus is on the four gospels because he did this in the four gospels, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The four gospels as we know, which was his ministry to Israel. Romans 15.8 says Jesus was a minister of the circumcision. Well, yeah, but he came to everybody. Well, it says he was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made to the fathers. Well, I don't see that in what I think about Jesus. What kind of doctrinal teaching are you teaching here? Well, he came for a purpose, a purpose he already stated, a purpose he had already revealed in the Scripture. But you see how asking the question, what would Jesus do, implies you don't need the Bible. That's what it is. You say, no, I never thought that. Well, yeah, but it's implicit in the question. Because the real question you should be asking is not what would Jesus do, but what did Jesus do? Like, what did he actually do? Well, I know he loved the poor. And he was, have you checked? Like, have you read the book? Because preaching can really go off a, a lot on this stuff. And it's really great. Everyone eats it up. They love it. Because we need to be more loving and more kind. And we shouldn't scream so much. And we should really be more accepting and and this is good stuff. Self-improvement, right? But is that what Jesus came to do? Is that what he actually did? And if he didn't do the, all that exactly, would it totally undermine our faith in this God-man Jesus? Well, if that's the God you preach, I don't want him as my God. This was, constantly came up in the 20th century. If that's the God of the Bible, I don't want him. It's not an appeal to you. It's about speaking truth. It's about being honest about things, not making things up. What would Jesus do? Focus on the four gospels. Look at John. There is nothing about you, the body of Christ, in these historical accounts. If you understand the simple biblical truth that the church, the body of Christ, did not begin until after Jesus died, let alone after he sent the Holy Ghost at Pentecost, after he revealed the mystery to Paul, then you know there's no description of you in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And we'll see that as we go on. But that really undermines using Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to ask what would Jesus do according to how we should act today? What if that's not your pattern? What do you mean Jesus is not the pattern? Well, he was sent to Israel. It was a different time after all. Now, Justin, you seem like a liberal. Jesus was outdated. God changed what he was doing through time. Right? And focusing on the four Gospels misses the Gospel Christ revealed to Paul later. <clears throat> I mean, the Apostle Paul said a Gospel, a dispensation of the Gospel is committed unto me. The Apostle Paul says, anything that was contrary to the Gospel of the grace of God committed to my trust. And he goes on to explain that Gospel was the long-suffering and mercy of God given to him, the chief of sinners, as a pattern to those which should hereafter believe. Christ set that up. But you don't read anything about that in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Okay. What would Jesus do needs to be replaced with what did Jesus do to bring the focus back to what the Scripture says. So we can know the real Jesus. Right. In fact, that question I'm asking right now, I'm not the first one to ask it. The first people to ask who the real Jesus was were those in the 20th century who wanted to question the Bible. And by questioning the Bible, they said, well, we want to know the historical Jesus. You know that's why there's red letters in your Bible? There's red letters because they were asking, what did Jesus really say? And they put doubt on everything else. And what was left was this unknown gospel of Q or the red letters, and that's what Jesus actually said. The rest of it, we don't know. Right. They, they asked the question to deny the Bible. I'm trying to ask it to jog our minds away from imagining what would he do. Let's open the Bible again and see what he actually said and did. Because we're so far removed from the Bible now as a result of the ideas, the consequences of these ideas, that Christians don't want to open a scripture and study anymore. And if they do, they don't want to accept it. Because there's been ideas that are so powerful in society 
that they can't accept what the Bible says over what the ideas that have had a long history have taught us. Well, it's not historical ideas. That's the truth, folks. It's the scripture that's been preserved. So what did Jesus do? Well, look at Matthew 3, verse 14 and 15. And a lot of these stories are known as sometimes the details that are left out. For example, Matthew 3 is a popular story, a popular stained glass window here. Matthew 3, 14, where Jesus, when he was water baptized, the Holy Ghost descended as a dove, and the, uh, the Father said from heaven, This is my beloved Son, whom I am well pleased. Everyone knows the story of Jesus' baptism. People even teach that. They say, well, there you go. You see, that's why we should water baptize. Jesus was, and so we should be as well. Well, that doesn't sound too bad unless we get into the actual details of what's happening in Matthew 3. Matthew 3, 13. Then comes Jesus from Galilee to Jordan, the Jordan River, unto John to be baptized of him in the river. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee. Now, why would John forbid anybody? I mean, come on, John. So Jesus is going to teach John a lesson here, right? Now I'm teaching with my tongue in my cheek, social gospel. Jesus is going to teach John, don't exclude anybody from this baptism, even me. That's not what he's teaching, obviously. This is a corruption of the scripture. The reason why John the Baptist forbade Jesus from being water baptized is because he didn't need to be. That's what he says. He says, I need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answered and said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becomes us to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus was without sin. John knew that. He was preaching water baptism for the repentance of uh, the remission of sins. And Jesus had no sins to repent of. To be remitted. He says, you don't need this. Right? Now, you don't hear that very often in churches because that would imply that you can't do what Jesus did here. Everyone who's water baptized, even though dispensationally accurate or not, is doing so because they're a sinner. Not Jesus. Not a sinner. That's why he was forbidden to be baptized. But Jesus insisted that he take the place of sinners. Fulfill the righteousness, by the way, the righteousness of the law. The law required it. Well, yeah, but it requires it because of sinners. I'm going to fulfill all righteousness by taking part in this baptism. And so he did so. And Jesus, when he was baptized, the Father acknowledges that this is my beloved Son, whom I well pleased. So what he did was right. Okay. You can't do what Jesus did in his water baptism. You can't do it. You say, he did it, so we should do it. Well, he did it without sin. You can't do it without sin. So... It's a different thing. All right. Look at John or Matthew 5, verse 17. Jesus came to fulfill all righteousness. Is that what you're supposed to do? On the surface, people say, oh, yes, of course, we should do right. <laughs> Doing right is different than being kind, isn't it? Remember? When I said it before, people were like, well, kindness is good. Jesus said fulfill all righteousness, not to do all kindness. Those are different things. Matthew 5, 17, he says, Think not I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy the law or the prophets, but to fulfill them. Can you do that? Like, what would Jesus do? Answer, he'd be sinless and fulfill the law and the prophets. That's what I'm going to do. You can't. Sorry, you can't do it. He already did it. He's the only one that can do it. Verse 18, for verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled, which he's going to fulfill. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments, and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. He came to fulfill the righteousness. The righteousness which he states is in the law. Okay. Look at John 3, 13. I specifically go to John 3, 13, knowing the baggage that comes with John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but everlasting life. Nobody can believe in you to have everlasting life. And so, what would Jesus do? Be the Savior of the world. What would I do? I'm going to save the world through my social gospel. You, no, you can't do it. That's not what Jesus came to do by saving the world, meaning that we're going to upturn the social system and set in place an economic theory from the 19th century, that's not what he was doing. Okay. John 3, 13. No man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. What would Jesus do? He would ascend down from heaven to preach the salvation gospel. You didn't come from heaven. He says in the verse, no man has ascended up to heaven. 
you're not from heaven. Never been there, and you won't be unless you're saved, and then you'll go there eventually. But you and I have no idea what it's like to be in heaven, right? Neither do we have the power to bring heaven to earth. The social gospel says otherwise, right? John 3, 13, And no man has ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven. Jesus is the one bringing salvation from heaven down to earth. Look at John 13, 36. What would Jesus do? I'm going to be a follower of Jesus. I understand your intent is good. I understand your thought perhaps is, I want to obey God in Jesus Christ, my Lord. That's a good intent. That's a good thought. You keep that. But you should answer that by saying, well, I'm going to read the scripture and how God instructs me to do what Jesus instructed to do. But John 13, 36, Peter and the disciples wanted to follow Jesus around. When they did, they dropped their nets and quit their jobs to follow Jesus for three years. In John 13, 36, Jesus at the end of this ministry says to Peter, Lord, where thou goest, Jesus answered, whether I go, you cannot follow me. Thou shalt follow me afterwards. Peter said to him, Lord, why cannot I follow thee now? What am I going to do? Like Peter literally followed Jesus, and he was asking, what is Jesus doing? And then he's doing what Jesus says to do. Right? And then Jesus one day says, I'm leaving, you can't follow me. Why not, Jesus? I want to follow you even when you're not here. Now, what are Christians doing today? They want to follow him even when he's not here. What did Jesus say in John 13, 36? Where I'm at, you can't come. Now, that was in John 13. Where's Jesus at today? In my heart. Now, he's in heaven. He's in heaven. Like, if you believe in him, I know he's, you know, it says in John 13 that you're the spirit of Christ. He's in heaven. And no matter how hard you try, apart from death, you can't get there. You can't follow him there. You see, this is taken the Bible literally, maybe too literally, I mean. We need to go back to spiritualization. We're going back 600 years in theology. You're going back before you had a Bible you can read. You're going back before you can actually read the scripture and believe it for yourself. Right? Where some religious uh, authority told you what to believe. That's what you're going back to. Here's the Bible in front of you. What did Jesus do? Look at Luke chapter 12. Jesus would be baptized twice. That's what he would do. I believe in baptism. People say, when you get water baptized, Jesus did it. Well, he was baptized twice. You going to do that? Uh, no, I believe in one baptism, Ephesians 4. Well, he was baptized twice. Luke chapter 12, verse 50, says that. It says, Suppose ye that I am come to give, well, excuse me, in verse 50, I have a baptism to be baptized with. Excuse me, Jesus, you were already water baptized. We heard the Father from heaven. We know he's your son. You're going to do that again? Is that your ministry? You get baptized to minister to other people? Which, ironically, is what Christians do today. They get water baptized. They say it's a testimony to other people. Nowhere in the Bible is that the case. Okay. But he was water baptized. Jesus spoke from heaven. That was a testimony to those that heard. And Jesus says, I'm going to be baptized again. He didn't mean water. How am I straight until it be accomplished? Because he was not water baptized again. He's talking about his death on the cross. Here, Jesus mentions his death on the cross as a baptism, identification with death and the sins of the world. Right? And so he says, I'm straight until it be accomplished. One baptism in water, one baptism into death. Paul talks all over about being baptized into Christ's death. Which baptism do you think Paul's talking about? You have two choices. Pick carefully. Luke 12, 50. What would Jesus do? Jesus would feed the hungry. Right? Yeah, he would. And he did. Because what did Jesus do? Well, he fed the hungry. In John chapter 6, verse 13. They were all out away from McDonald's, and they didn't have quick access to Papa John's delivery. And so Jesus said, what do we got? They brought a few loaves and fishes. Not enough for the whole crowd. Jesus does a miracle. Okay. And he multiplies the loaves. So in your outline, it's wonder bread, right? It's a wonder and a miracle. He multiplies the loaves, and everyone gets food, everyone gets fishes. That's how he provided what it doesn't say is Jesus filled out an application to provide to, for the local government to give a subsidy to provide for the meal that afternoon. Because no one was working that day, and they're doing a good, good cause. And so they filled out the application, and the government bureaucrat said, okay, this is an acceptable situation. Here's your check for the month. And Jesus says, I got the check. Everyone's going to be fed by what I got. That's a lot in there. That's too specific. He performed a miracle. Like, I, I might suggest here, and I know people will try to debate this, but there's no scriptural evidence of it, that Jesus was not a wealthy man. He didn't walk around with a big old purse. And he's like, hey, I got enough. Woohoo! 
He wasn't. He saw Hungary and he fed them because of the need to preach and talk to them. But the way he fed them is a pattern you cannot follow. What would Jesus do? He would multiply that hamburger. That's what he'd do. But you've got to pay for your own today. <laughs> you can't do that. Only he could do that. John 6, verse 19. When they rowed about 5 and 20 and 30 furlongs, Jesus isn't in the boat when the disciples cross the water. He says, I'll, I'll meet you up later. They said, how? First century Uber, what's happening? John 6, 19, they look out in the water, they see Jesus walking on the water. Miracle, right? Miracle. Praise be to God. There it is. Miracle, walking on the water. Peter, of course, you know, jumps out in, in Matthew and he walks out with him for a little bit. He's walking on the water. What would Jesus do? I need to get from here to there. I think he would just walk right across it. You've got to go around. You see the problem of asking the question, what would Jesus do, without knowing what he actually did? It means that you're not going to give significance to the things that only Jesus could do, and he came for a reason to do them. You're going to think, well, everything he could do, we can do. He was just a social rebel or revolutionary, and we can do that too. You can't walk on water. Well, how does that overturn society? Well, you want to have a technological argument, or you just want to know the theology behind it? The theology is he's God, and your trust in him and what he did is what changes men's souls. Right? But, you know, it'd be nice to hover on water, too. There have not been a lack of people who, with modern technology, try to recreate the miracles of Jesus. It's interesting. They can't do it. John eleven forty three. 43. Now, at this point, people are going, well, surely when people ask the question, what would Jesus do? They're not going to think they're going to do what Jesus actually did. But that's not the point. I'm not trying to say people are trying to do what Jesus actually did. I'm saying they don't care what he actually did. They're going to invent in their mind something they think they should do based on the image of Jesus that may not be biblical entirely. Some of it may be true, but it may not be the whole truth. If you want to know what Jesus would want for you to do, you need to know all there is to know about Jesus, <clears throat> what his will is. John 11, verse 43. Jesus raised from the dead. When you see someone's grandma die, Okay? They didn't wear the mask, grandma died. What would Jesus do? Raise them from the dead. That's what he would do. Right? Well, with modern science, we have the ability to increase people's lifespans. Not the same. Not the same. He spoke, Lazarus come forth, he came out of the tomb. Right? That's what Jesus did. And what Jesus did, not everything he did, we can do. Well, we can do those things that we can do. Well, yeah, but that's that's not doing what Jesus did. <clears throat> Jesus forgave men their sins. I can do that. No, you can't. You can say, I forgive you, but you're not God. You forgiving someone and God forgiving someone are two totally different things. Yes, God would be more forgiving. Actually, no. If you read the Bible, it's harder for God to forgive a sinner without Christ's sacrifice than you or I to forgive each other because we're related or we're friends really is. <clears throat> well, yeah, but now Jesus Christ has died for sin, so it's much easier for God to forgive. Well, that's true. He's reconciled the world to himself, right? But forgiveness is given to those that believe. You reject Christ, you don't get the benefits of what Christ did. Amen. But that's actually being argued today against by different people. Oh, no. Not the, not the God I know. Is it the God of the Bible? Is it the Jesus of the Bible? But Jesus forgave men their sins. Forgave men of their sins to whom people thought you could not forgive sins. Like, again, the marginalized, the sick, the poor, the destitute, the criminal. He forgave their sins. Jesus forgave their sins because they showed a response of faith. That's why it happened. They, they let the guy down from the ceiling. Remember? Lowered him down from the ceiling. You think that's a lack of faith? No, I don't think so. Right? Jesus didn't say, all you who reject me and kill me. Oh, wait a minute, on the cross he says, Father, forgive them. God gave them a chance in, in Acts 2 and 3. Then God gave them up. How long would God forgive people that reject him? Well, that's a question worthy of biblical study. John 20, 23, <clears throat> he gave the power for other men to forgive sins. Chosen men, apostles. And the Roman Catholics to this day use this teaching to 
justify their priestly forgiveness of sins. He said, Jesus says here, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto him. Whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Why would we need to retain sins? I thought we're all about forgiveness here. Apparently, that's an option. Like, in what world does the disciple say, your sins not forgiven? Well, the same world Jesus lives in, when he said in Matthew and in Mark, there's a sin that's a blasphemy of the Holy Ghost, it will not be forgiven in this life or the next. Or the world of 1 John 5, which says that there's some sins you don't pray for, they're not going to be forgiven. What? Yeah, that's Bible. That's not your creation. Is God forgiving? Yes. Is his mercy endure forever? Yes. Is he forgiveness to the whole world undeservedly? Yes. Is it offered to all freely? Yes. But not everyone and every sin is going to get forgiven. The question that should follow that is, well, how do I know the difference? I want all my sins to be forgiven. Well, good. The gospel of the grace of God today is that your sins are forgiven through Christ's finished work on the cross. All of them. Trust his finished work. Your sins are forgiven. Right. But you see, what would Jesus do? There were some sins he said, Mark chapter 4, not forgiven. Hmm. I thought he never said no. I mean, that's what love would do, right? Never say no. Jesus, the first commandment, whenever someone tells you and uses the Bible as a weapon against you, who believe the Bible and want to know and trying to do God's will, and they say to you, you should do what we say, or you should act not in accordance to the scripture because of love your neighbor. Whenever you hear that argument, always throw a, red, a yellow flag on the, on the field, a red flag up in the air. Whenever you hear anybody say, love your neighbor, you say, how and why? And it's not to say that loving your neighbor is not bad. It's because it's the second commandment. The first one is love God. Because too often, way too often, love your neighbor has been used to deny the first one. That's why you should ask the question and throw the flag. Just hesitate. Like, ask, well, why? What? Are you doing this because you love God, or are you doing this because of your own thought? Because loving your neighbor without loving God first is sin. Amen. That's what it is. But the world doesn't re receive that. The world doesn't think that loving your neighbor and denying the Bible is a problem. After all, Jesus taught love your neighbor. Yes, and he taught first love God. Jesus did what he did because he was God, because he loved the truth, because he was the truth. That's why he showed love to the poor and to the neighbors. That's why he also would say, well, you have to believe, and why he would overturn tables and judge certain things. Because truth was the first priority. Without truth, you have a problem with showing love. Real love. Okay. What would Jesus do? Well, he would communicate the truth. He forgave men their sins. Jesus died for sins. That's the ultimate act of God's love towards humanity. So he committed his, his love and that he died for us while we were yet sinners. Romans 5 verse 8. But Paul says he died for sins. Died for sinners. Right? What would Jesus do? He would die for sinners. Yeah, yeah, I don't mean that. I mean, like, if he wasn't the Savior, what he would do? Because I'm not the Savior. You can't make Jesus not the Savior. Well, I'm not trying to do that. Well, that's what's implied in the question, that you can do what Jesus did. You can't. Accept it. Right? In fact, maybe you should preach the Savior. Preach what he did. Maybe that'll help. And, and I, I say that kind of cavalierly, but the Bible says you should do that. You should actually preach what Jesus did. So what, what, what would Jesus do in the situation to sinners? Well, he would pre tell you to preach his finished work. Okay. You can't do what Jesus did. Some things Jesus did, a lot of things he did, none even dare to do today. And it's not that you couldn't do them, but many don't dare do them. Uh, in Luke 12, for example, we just read that he was baptized twice. Right after that, he says, think ye I come to give peace on earth? <laughs> Who doesn't think that? <laughs> He's kind, mild, loves everybody, doesn't say no. He wants to give peace on earth. He's overturning the social system and that hatred everywhere, and he's going to give peace on earth. That's why he was born, to give peace on earth, goodwill toward men, yes? And then 10 chapters later, Jesus says, think you can't get peace on earth? And the shepherds are going, yeah, it's what the angels said. And he says, nay, rather division. Read it, Jesus' own words. Are you going to believe the angels or Jesus? I believe Jesus every time. Well, you got a question here. Angels or Jesus? Angels said peace on earth. Jesus said division on earth. Well, Justin, are you saying there's a mistake in the Bible? No, the angels weren't wrong. They were talking about the future peace in the coming kingdom, which wasn't here yet. And Jesus came in his earthly ministry to divide. Now, there should be a good question to those who are wise about this, saying, well, what is he dividing and why? That's a good question. Right. 
We need to rightly divide, not wrongly divide, right? So we need to make a proper judgment about what to divide from the other. And Jesus came not simply to divide ideas, but people. You say, this is really going against my thought of who Jesus was. That's the intent of the lesson today. What would Jesus do? You've got to know who Jesus was first and what he actually did. Okay. The division Jesus came to bring was in the nation of Israel. Because there were those that believed and those who did not. Israel was created as a nation to serve God. Jesus was God in the flesh. He came, and he came to make that division clear. Not everyone here serves God. And how would you know? If they believe me not, if they accept me, if they receive me, you'll know. Right. That's the division he came to bring. So Israel was split in two. In fact, it's more kind of like, you know, 99% versus the small 1%. But they were divided. Those who believed and received Jesus, he gave the power to become the sons of God. John chapter 1, yes? That's called the remnant of Israel, that which remains of Israel. He called them the little flock, because there was this nation, but a lot of them are wolves in sheep's clothing. And so there's a little flock, Jesus called them in Luke chapter 12, verse 32. He came to divide that. That's why he came. But this doesn't really go against our social theory. Well, then throw out the social theory. Because Jesus came for a purpose to do something that the Bible describes. And people just don't study it to figure that out or want to accept it. So he came to cause division. In Luke 12, 33, he told the people that received him to sell everything they had. Right? Now, it's verses like this that come up repeatedly in Jesus' ministry to sell everything you have, to store up treasures in heaven, to sell everything you have, to give to the poor, right? Matthew 19, 21, the, the person comes to him and says, how shall I have eternal life? And he gives them commandments to do, the law of Moses. He says, I've done all that. Well, the next step is sell everything you have and give to the poor. Well, there it is. Jesus loved the poor. Sell everything you got. We need to sell what we have and give to the poor. So you should not be against a welfare system in our society because it provides for the poor. As Jesus said to do, sell your private possessions and make them publicly accessible. Right? And that is the biblical justification of Charles Sheldon's idea, among others, of Christian socialism. That's what Charles Sheldon, in his steps, advocated. And that's what he taught. That's what he wrote about. Okay? Ideas have consequences. It's not just a good story. But that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, I'm preaching the kingdom at hand. Sell all that you have. And he did not say, give it to the IRS. Give it to the government. Oh, no, he said, render to Caesar and to Caesars. Yeah, he did, which means you're not giving to the poor, are you? Giving to the poor meant you give it to the poor. Like, to the poor. Well, I don't know who the poor are. I'll just give it to the government. They'll figure it out. Do you think an unbelieving government is going to figure out who the real needy are? Well, you're more naive than I thought. You know, they're not going to know that. If any, anything, someone with spiritual eyes, someone who can discern spiritually, will understand who's truly needy or not. Well, that guy's really needy. He has nothing to drink, nothing at all. Going to the bar ten times a week, you know. I don't know. Even drunks need to eat, too. This is the dilemma, isn't it? I give him money. Is he just going to get more drunk? Is he going to waste it on that sort of thing? Well, this has been a conversation throughout human history. How do you, how do you give to the poor? It was such a conversation that in the 1300s, even before the Bible was put in many languages of the people uh, after the Reformation, there were Christian priests and monks who studied this question. How do we give to the poor? There were people teaching an idea, maybe you've heard it recently, as we just reached 8 billion people on the planet. They were teaching an idea hundreds of years ago that... There's too many people in Europe. There's too many people. We don't have enough farmland to provide enough food for all the people in Europe. The guy's name was Thomas Malthus, Malthusian theory. We don't enough people, and so people are going to have to die. I mean, obviously, only people that maybe deserve it first, and uh, we need to be kind about the whole situation, but we either we're all going to die or some of us are going to die. Right? Right? And uh, the Christians didn't like that at all. So they're like, we've got to figure this out. How can we help the poor and help we solve these issues? The whole study of economics and free market trade came from Christians asking, how do we help the poor? That's where it came from. So what you can't do to help the poor is steal from somebody. It doesn't help anybody. You can't say, I'll help the poor. I'll steal from you. There you go. Isn't that Robin Hood? Yeah. Not the real story, but it's another story for another day. But yeah, that's how people present Robin Hood. It's okay to steal from them. Well, who are we following here? Jesus or Robin Hood? Jesus said, sell what you have and give to the poor. He didn't say, sell your neighbor's things and give to the poor. He didn't say, steal from your neighbor and give to the poor. He said, sell what you have and give to the poor. He didn't say, sell what you have and give to the government. Sell what you have and give to the poor. You can't change the scripture. 
This is the problem with that. But now I'm going off on a tangent here. He taught to sell everything you had to help the poor. He, he came to preach a gospel to the poor. Luke 4 says, I came to preach a gospel to the poor, the good news to the poor. The good news to the poor was not good news, you'll have more money. Right? But that is the social gospel, gospel to the poor. You'll have more money. Your financial position will be more equal with that of others. That was not what Jesus came to say. You're poor, they're rich, don't you hate that? I'm going to set that straight. Jesus didn't do that. He never taught that. Look at Matthew chapter 5 and the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes, blessed are this, blessed, the very first one is, blessed are the poor in spirit. When Jesus mentioned the poor in Luke chapter 4, he preaches the good news to you, it was the poor in spirit, those who were oppressed. Well, that's it, the oppressed people financially. No, the oppressed people righteously, like they were oppressed by wickedness. They wanted to do right. Those who are poor in spirit are blessed in the kingdom of Christ because God's righteousness will reign on the earth. And if you want right, that's when it happens. Right? That's what he taught. It wasn't those who were financially poor. So what, did he spurn the financially poor? No, he didn't do that either. But like I told you, he wasn't a wealthy man going around distributing money. He made collections for poor. Judas, the, 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 one of the only examples of Jesus' disciple ministry there, actually giving money to the poor is when Judas piped up and said, this ointment that she spread on your feet, remember that? Shouldn't we sell that and give it to the poor? Jesus says, not this one. What would Jesus do? Keep some for himself. No, he's God in the flesh, you see? That's why he did that. He was a sacrifice. He was being anointed for his upcoming sacrifice for the sins of the world. What would Jesus do? Really, there's a lot of question, uh, problems with asking the question that way. What did Jesus do? So you wouldn't dare do that. You wouldn't dare sell everything you have. Now, some people are so audacious and young to say, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to sell my possessions, which, like I said, they're young, which they don't have an, a, a lot, um, which is saying something. But they sell what they have, and they think God's going to answer some sort of prayer they have or give them blessing. This is what Jesus taught. So kudos for trying to do exactly what Jesus said to do. But unfortunately, that's not what he's telling you to do today. In the same Bible that says, sell all that you have, Jesus told the Apostle Paul to or quit your parents and provide for your own family and your own house. If you don't work, you don't eat. That's what Jesus taught the Apostle Paul. Right? So when you say, what would Jesus do? Do you mean what would Jesus do in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Or what would Jesus do later when he came back and revealed information to the Apostle Paul? Same Jesus, different time. Right? In fact, the same Jesus taught two different things in his earthly ministry. At one point, take no thought for what you shall eat and take no script. Later in the same time period, like later in time, but in the same lifetime, Jesus said, take script. Am I not to take it or to take it? Well, again, the common sense will tell you that you have to do the latest instruction. And even still, Luke 22 isn't the latest thing Jesus said. What would Jesus do is, is a good question, but not the best question. And it definitely deflects the attention away from the scripture and more towards what you think Jesus would do instead of what he actually did. John 2.15 he drove men out of the temple with cords. Now, this is constantly brought up as an example in Christianity to get you to be more zealous, right? You should be more zealous, like Jesus. I mean, he, he walked to the temple and drove people out with cords. And that might encourage people to be more motivated, except that nobody ever does that. Nobody ever does that, right? Now, if you have, raise your hand, please. I'd like to talk to you. I think it would be an amazing story, I guess. Walking into a temple or a church and with a cord, get out, get out. You'd be arrested. No one dare do that. Now, you could, but nobody dare do it. Right? Jesus warned people of hell. and Something else people don't dare to do anymore. John 5, 29, he says, there'll be those who resurrect unto damnation. John 5, 29, Jesus' own words. Some will resurrect unto life, some will resurrect unto damnation. Jesus, Jesus. If you've got to choose be kind or be right, please, be kind. Damnation, Really? Look at Matthew 23, verse 23. Now, I'm doing this to point out the error in Charles Sheldon's idea that wasn't new with him. It was just fictionalized and popularized by him. But it's grounded in wrong doctrine and theology. Okay? Matthew 23, verse 33. Jesus' red-letter words here. Ye serpents. Ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? Now, he doesn't answer the question. 
it's like rhetorical, obviously, but he's bringing it up. I mean, is that the approach of ministry? I mean, this is the same guy who said, they'll know you by your love. How do you reconcile those two statements? Jesus says, they'll know you by your love. How can you? Now he's here talking to the Pharisees and scribes. How will you escape the damnation of hell? What is it? Is he like, you know, Robert Schuller on one day and Greta Thornburg on the other? It's like, how, how, do, you, how do you reconcile? Well, Jesus is judging according to righteousness, and love is according to truth, right? That's why he can say both things. Love doesn't mean you can never resist anybody. That's not what love means, okay? Love is defined by God as the benefit of other people and enjoying the benefit of other people, which can only come by people acknowledging the truth. 1 Corinthians 13, the famous love, which is really the charity chapter, Paul defines that. Charity is rejoicing in truth, not in iniquity. So if you're rejoicing in iniquity, that is not biblical love. That was the right Christian answer in the late 90s and early 2000s. And they said, well, people just want to get married and love each other. What's wrong with that, Christians? You say God is love. Jesus loves everybody. The right answer is love is not rejoicing in iniquity. Amen. You call what we do a sin? Yes, we are. That's the right answer. Not, oh, we didn't mean to say that. I mean, we need to be loving. Hold on here. You, you, you saw... The Christian mind, you know, blowing up. The cogs had rusted and the, the, the coils were springing out of the Christian mind because we'd been taught, what would Jesus do in this situation? But they didn't actually read what he did, you see. In Matthew 25, verse 46, Jesus talks more about hell than anyone else in the New Testament, I'll tell you that. These shall go away into everlasting punishment, the righteous unto life eternal. Of course, you've heard this before. And I only bring this up not to say, well, this is the only thing Jesus ever said. He didn't. But simply the other side of the story, as Paul Harvey would say. Now you know the rest of the story. Right? Because you can't leave half of it out. That's not the whole truth. In John 8, 44, he calls people children of the devil because the devil had certain doctrines that these people were believing. And he said, oh, apparently, you're doing his service. Okay. Look at Matthew 10, verse 5. Jesus doesn't exclude anyone. I mean, he ate with sinners. That's true. And he called them to repentance. Every time Jesus ate with sinners, he called them to repentance. Every time sinners wanted to be around Jesus, it wasn't because he accepted their sin. He called them to repentance. Every time. Matthew 10, verse 5. These 12 disciples that he just chose, he sent forth and commanded them. The first thing he commands, all right, 12 guys, go and show people how I've loved you and love each other accordingly. First thing he says, go not into the way of the Gentiles. Go, but go not where Gentiles are at. Samaritans don't go there either. Now again, you might say, well, he did talk to the Samaritan woman. Indeed he did. But he also said this. <laughs> you can't deny one verse with another verse. You have to take them all. Okay. He said, don't go to Gentiles. Why did he say that? That doesn't sound like something people would dare to do in their ministries today. And I, I would say you should not that in your ministry today. But if you don't follow that, you're not following Matthew 10, verse 5, and you're not obeying Jesus' words in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In the 15, 26, he calls a Canaanite woman a dog after ignoring her twice. She's a dog. Well, the, the Hebrew and Aramaic there, dog, wasn't like, you know, modern slang. It was more, it wasn't good what he called her. He was putting her in her place. Feminists rise up. Wait a minute. That's not my Jesus. I, well, Matthew 15, what do you do? She was a Gentile woman. Salvation was of the Jews, which, by the way, is not a phrase Jesus utters in his encounter with a Samaritan woman in the Chosen TV series. There's a reason for that. Because they ask themselves, what would Jesus do? And they don't read the Bible, say what he actually did, so they leave that part out. Because salvation of the Jews, that's really going to make it exclusive to Jews. Right? Yep, that's what he came to minister to, the lost sheep of the house of Israel, Matthew 15, 26. You wouldn't do what Jesus did if you actually asked the question and learned what he did in the scripture in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, again, I keep pointing out Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John because that's not all that Jesus came to do. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that historical account happened here. There's things Jesus did here. There's things Jesus did here. After he rose from the dead and sent the Holy Ghost and called the Apostle Paul, Jesus worked outside his earthly ministry. 
So, I mean, there is some, there's, Jesus is our Lord and Savior. He's our head. So we should do what Jesus wants us to do. I'm saying the wrong place to find is in Matthew, Luke, and John. And I'm trying to give you examples to show people of how you might shock them into admission that, yeah, I guess we shouldn't be doing what Jesus said to do or what he did in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Well, where do you go then? Right? Well, so you're, you're trying to show them what God's will is today. Jesus in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John was a lover of the law. Yeah. I almost said Jesus was a legalist here in my outline, but I thought that'd be a little, a little edgy. But he was under the law, and he taught the law, and he commanded other people to keep the law. What do you call that? Like, if a Christian taught what Jesus taught in Matthew, Luke, and John today, to the exclusion of what he later said to Paul, they would be labeled legalists. They would. Galatians 4.4 4 says Jesus was made of a woman born under the law, which means Jesus was circumcised. You'd be shocked at the number of people that answer the question, should I circumcise my baby? and answer it based on Jesus being circumcised. You'd be shocked. It happens quite a bit. Luke chapter 2, verse 21, that's just a, an example there, but in Luke chapter 2, his mother, Mary, offered sacrifices when he was born, illustrating the fact that he was born under the law. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, every day that was accounted for Jesus' earthly ministry before he died was part of the Old Testament. What would Jesus do? He would be living under the Old Testament. That's what he would be doing. So even if you don't understand the mystery given to Paul and you think you're a new covenant Christian, you would not be operating how Jesus operated in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John under the Old Testament law. Well, yeah, but he came to overturn that with the new, better covenant. But it was not implemented in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And therefore, he obeyed, as righteous dictated, the Old Testament law. His mother did. He did. Matthew 5, we've already covered verse 17 through 18, that he taught the law of Moses. He did not come to destroy it, but he taught it. Your righteousness has to exceed, not your kindness, and that's what he said, your righteousness has to exceed the righteous of the Pharisees. Matthew 8, verse 4, he tells the man he healed. You say, yeah, Jesus helps the hurt and the sick. Yep, he healed the lame man and then told him, go offer the gift that Moses required. Right? Which... I guess, to be fair, a lot of faith healers do that even today. Did you receive a healing today? We're going to ask you to give your sacrifice up on the altar. You see, that's what Jesus said to do. Go offer that gift that Moses required. In Matthew 23, he says outright to his disciples, those that sit in Moses' seat, even though they don't believe me, even though they don't acknowledge me, they are sitting in Moses' seat and they're teaching Moses' law. And therefore, he says... Whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But Jesus, they're teaching the law of Moses. That was precisely his point. Hear the law, do the law. Okay? Look at Matthew 23 in the same chapter, verse 23. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, not because you are scribes and Pharisees, but because they were hypocrites. Right? Pharisees would have been the right-wing conservatives of Jesus' day. And the scribes... Those are the people who are trying to preserve the scripture. He called them hypocrites. That was their problem. Okay. He says, you're hypocrites. For you pay tithe of minute, uh, mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law. Social rebel, rebel Jesus was. You've omitted the weightier matters of the law. Judgment, mercy, and faith. There it is. Judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought you have done and not to leave the other undone. Notice first on the list there is judgment. Well, we're, we're going to skip right over that one. Mercy and faith, we'll stick with that. Judgment, mercy, and faith. But notice also he says, these ought you have done. Judgment, mercy, and faith. And not to leave the other undone. Whoops. This is the verse, the only verse Jesus mentions tithing. And when you ask a church why they teach tithing, this will come up in their list of justifications. Because Jesus taught tithing in this verse. Then you say, well, do you tithe mint, anise, and cumin? No, 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 no. Money. Well, Jesus said you should tithe men, innocent human. Because that was what the law required. And Jesus was saying, do the law. All of it. Not just tithing. Jesus loved the law. People say, well, Jesus had a lot of moral teachings. Right? And he did. Okay? And though I don't have time to uh, uh, enumerate them, he taught a lot of good, righteous things because he came to fulfill all righteousness. The moral teachings of Jesus, if you call them that, the moralities of Jesus, were because he was properly applying the law of God. 
So every moral principle and good behavior that people want to say, what would Jesus do in good behavior? Well, he would do this or that. Every one of those things is an application of the law of God, the law of Moses. Understand? It's not new. Jesus says, you heard the law say this. I'm going to magnify that a little bit more. He doesn't destroy the law. He doesn't get rid of it. He teaches it clearly. He applies it perfectly. Righteous judgment. John 8, you say, what about the adulterous woman? He let her go. No. He said, you without sin, stone her. That's what he said. He kept the law and showed that the law showed mercy. Because when the law said, stone the adulterous woman, it also said, stone your children. How many parents are doing that? Well, that's why we don't like the law. The law of God is perfect and holy and just. Stoning your children, you say, well, that's kind of extreme. No, it's perfect and just. By them rebelling against you, they're rebelling implicitly against God. But who, who, what parent does that? They don't. Why not? Because parents know I was a child once, and he's a child, and he's my child, and I love him as well as want him to be good. Mm, righteousness and love. How do I deal with this? I guess I'll show mercy, but also discipline. I guess I'll, do this. I guess I'll determine whether I'm going to stone him today or not. Maybe I won't. You see, and that happens a multitude of times. Jesus says the same thing. You without sin cast the first stone. Right? Let's put her sin in perspective of yours to see how it judges up. Right? And he says, go ahead. Now, he was the only one there without sin, right? He could have, and what he do? As the law also required, the judge could give mercy as well. Amen. Which is how anyone would live through the law. It was through God's mercy, who endures forever, which endures forever. So Jesus applied the law perfectly. He did not teach in John chapter 8, which, by the way, a lot of people think should not be in your Bible anyway. But John, he did not teach there. Adulterous woman, trust my death on the cross for your sins, and I'll forgive you of my sins through my substitutionary atonement. He didn't teach that. <laughs> he kept the law perfectly. Okay. So when people are asking, what would Jesus do, trying to apply the moral teachings of Jesus, they're asking, what would the law tell me to do? That's what they're asking. You see the problems with what would Jesus do? If it's applied to Matthew, Luke, and John, you're saying, what does the law teach? Which is not a bad question, except that God has now dispensed grace so as Christians in the church, we should know not only the law, but God's grace that supersedes and abounds over it. That would be nice. All right. Am I getting too snarky here? I don't tend to do that. I'm trying to show people through just the superficial desire they have to do and walk with as the disciples what Jesus did when you don't have the opportunity to do that anymore. His lifetime ministry is over. You're not a disciple. You're not an apostle. Those were already chosen. He died for your sins. He rose from the dead. He sent the Holy Ghost. He revealed the dispensation of grace to the Apostle Paul. And he's created you a member of his body, a part of a new creature, something else he's doing in this dispensation, which will exhibit by your own salvation the need for God's grace through faith. Because that's how you were saved. And so you'll show other people grace through the faith in Jesus Christ because he's forgiven them if they trust the gospel. And so this is our ministry because of what Christ has done to us, not what Christ did with Israel. So there is a what does our head want us to do question, right, when we rightly divide the scripture. Jesus, in the so-called Lord's Prayer, taught people to forgive others, or, or taught people to pray for God to forgive them if they forgave other people, right? So forgiveness was conditional. Their forgiveness from God was conditioned on their forgiving other people, right? And this is how some people teach loving your neighbor. Like, well, love your neighbor, because if you love your neighbor, then God will love you. Well, that's kind of contrary to the gospel of grace of God, isn't it? Because God committed his love toward you that while you're yet a sinner, not loving your neighbor, he died for you. So it's a different message of God's love expressed. Mark 10, 17, Jesus straight up says that eternal life is given by obeying the law. How do I have eternal life? He says, keep the law. And commentators, to get around that legalist answer to the question, have to say, well, he was trying to teach him a lesson, you know, that he couldn't do it. And why did he go on to say, well, good job and sell all that you have? And he didn't, at that point, go, no, buddy, you're a sinner. You shouldn't do what Jesus did under the law. You're not under the law. You're under grace, Romans 6, 14. You operate according to grace principles. Jesus never communicated how to walk after the Spirit. Like, he didn't use that language. He didn't talk about that. The Spirit hadn't come yet. You find that language in the Apostle Paul's writings. The church is created by the Holy Ghost sealed believers in the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
After Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus did some things there too. What, did Jesus, what would Jesus do? He would be in heaven sending the Holy Ghost down at Pentecost, causing people to speak in tongues. That's what he would do in Acts 2. Is he doing that today? What would Jesus do over here? Well, in Romans 15, 8, he was a minister of the circumcision. But Romans 15, 16, Paul says that the gospel of the grace of God was given to him as a minister of Jesus Christ. So, to Gentiles. So, Paul was sent to the world. Jesus was sent to Israel to perform a function of fulfilling the prophecies. And then he reveals to Paul a message of salvation by grace through faith to the world. What would Jesus do today? Well, he would tell you to listen to what he said to the last apostle of grace sent to Gentiles, the apostle of the Gentiles. Right. Romans 16.25, Paul says, you're established, you're solidified, you're complete by the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. A mystery that was not revealed here. Here's the mystery of Christ, not there. Here's the mystery of Christ here. Okay? And... Paul says, you're established by the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. You're not going to find it here. What would Jesus do? He says, didn't you hear about the mystery that I revealed? None of his disciples knew about it. They didn't even know about the cross. Okay. The gospel of grace that was given to Paul is not the same as the gospel of the kingdom that Jesus taught in Matthew, Matthew and John, which kind of destroys this idea here, the social gospel idea. The whole kingdom being literal and we're trying to build it today. Well, if the gospel of the kingdom is no longer being preached and it says it's been substituted with the gospel of the grace of God to all in the kingdoms, the fallen kingdoms of this world, then we're not trying to build the kingdom. We're trying to get people saved. Right? Get them edified by the truth. The gospel of grace is only given because of what Christ did according to the mystery, which was his finished work on the cross, his creation of a new creature, the body of Christ called the church. Well, there's no difference between Jew and Gentile. You want to preach there's no difference and Jesus wouldn't exclude people? Preach the body of Christ. Don't preach the red letters back here because that's not what he did there. Amen. Right? The body of Christ, there's no Jew or Gentile, no male, no female in Christ Jesus. And all who believe the gospel can be saved and be made one in Christ Jesus. See, that's it, that's it. But there's no earthly literal kingdom going on there. So you can't corrupt the teaching with a social gospel when you rightly divide it. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 16, Paul says, We know no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh. The sequel to In His Steps was Jesus is here. <laughs> I mean, there's something blasphemous about that. There's why there was a lot of resistance to that. Because it's like, well, Christians believe that Jesus will return, and that's not how it's looking like. I mean, less so, but similar category, I think, of fiction was left behind. You know, like, at least it tried to put Jesus coming sometime in the, the future. But like, it's a fictional account with a lot of wrong doctrine in it. And the Jesus is here thing, it's not worth your, your money and time. You have limited time to read books in this life, you know. Not, not a decent use of time, but Jesus coming down, being an average guy like you and me, and walk on this planet to change the world again, is, not, is really diminishing what he came to do before. Right? People don't care about what he did before. They want to know what he's doing right now in my life, and they want him to do the same things he was doing before, but he's already finished his purpose before, and he's working today through a spiritual body of Christ who trusts the gospel of the grace of God, who are not living in a kingdom, are not walking after their flesh, but after the spirit. But none of this will help your political agenda. All right? What would Jesus do? We know no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ through the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ... He is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. He's given to us the ministry of reconciliation based on the finished work of Jesus Christ. Christ would tell you to heed the scripture that he gave to the Apostle Paul. He would say, I came back. Jesus returned, not to the earth, but in heavenly blinding glory to Paul. And he saw him and Jesus said, I'm sending you with my message of grace to the Gentiles, the Jews, to all the world. And he did that. And so when we read Paul's epistles and follow Paul's pattern, we are doing what Christ instructed to the church. And now you don't have to ask anymore, what would Jesus do? Because you know what he's doing. You know what he did. You know what salvation is. You know the task, right? That means we shouldn't struggle with our flesh. We dealt with that a couple weeks ago. We walk after the Spirit. Jesus has provided everything that you need. And what he's provided you is a book with instructions and words. 
what he's given you is the church, the body of Christ, to edify one another. What he's given you is the Holy Ghost that dwells in you when you believe. Any questions, any comments?